Hello, everybody. Today, we are joined by Reem El Sayer. Reem is the head of Financial Regulatory Group at Linklaters Middle East. Link has specialized knowledge of legal and regulatory matters and a detailed understanding of modern financial markets and infrastructure. Reem graduated from Trinity College in Dublin with a bachelor's in law. She also has a master's in commercial law from the University of Cambridge. Born and raised in the Bay, Reem has also worked in London and Singapore. Reem, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Saida. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So, Reem, few have been impacted as much as I guess you have, professionally speaking, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, you have spent majority of last year working very, very closely with banks, with regulators on the changing face of the industry, on dealing with the impact that uh, the pandemic has had on all the different elements and all the different facets of financial services. One of the things we hear about again and again is how fast and how rapidly digitization is setting in and uh, how quickly not only customers, but also employees are switching to digital services, to digital solutions. Given the amount of regulation and risk management that banks have to keep in mind and balance, how have you seen this evolve um, over the last year and how have regulations evolved to keep pace with this? It's um it's a really good question, Saida, and and a, and a bit of a tough one to answer. Covid uh, Covid nineteen was a was a black swan event, right? No one could have predicted it. Um, it had severe impact on, on on the way we conduct business, on the way that we work, on the way that we that we live our lives, and all of those changes are magnified when the business that you conduct is the provision. Of a regulated financial system. So banks found themselves in a situation where their model, their historical model, which relied on bricks and mortar as a means of offering a service, but also as a means of managing risk, was disrupted. And they didn't have access to the security of you know, purpose-built premises where you couldn't necessarily engage with another part of the bank or, you know, where, where customers could go for face-to-face -face communication. Suddenly, customers were at home but still needed to access their financial services and employees were also at home but still needed to access their, um, their work platform. And what all of this did was put a huge amount of stress on the infrastructure that was already there because banks and financial services firms were already on the path of innovation. I think most players in the industry had bought into the idea that digitization is a fact, it's happening, um, and you know, banks were already on that path. What COVID did was accelerate it down, um, accelerate banks and, and financial institutions down that path, sometimes faster than they were, um, that they were comfortable with. Um, and when that happened, uncalculated risk creeped in. And, and that was a worldwide phenomenon. And unfortunately, many took um, advantage of the fact that people were working from home, that, that people were accessing financial services from home and you know, engaging with their financial services providers all online. And you know, there was a huge spike in things like cybercrime during, during lockdown. And that was a, that was a global phenomenon. And this is where good regulation comes in. A recognition by the regulators of the reality of financial services now, which is very different to what it was 12 months ago, and the new risk that that brings in, and how best to, to mitigate those risks. And, and as I said, you know, we were already on this path, maybe not as we wouldn't have, um, uh, we wouldn't have gone down it as quickly as we did last year, um, but there were still very much processes that were ingrained in in face-to-face -face contact, like like KYC or signature verification. A lot of that is is being digitized and and moving online. And so we need to find a better, more secure way for those processes to to continue and be as effective as you know they are today, but in an online world. 
That makes a lot of sense. Now, you were 18 when you left for Dublin. You were a young woman going out alone for an, for an education. What was that experience like, especially given the context that you were a young, single Emirati girl who was uh, going to perhaps uncharted territory, uncharted country in some ways? Yeah. Um, I love getting asked that question because I spent some of the best years of my life in Dublin. <laughs> it was it was very exciting, um, but it was also really terrifying. So I think the first time I had ever done anything alone was the time that I flew back because I went with my parents and they settled me in. The time that I flew back for Christmas break, that was the first time that I had ever traveled alone. And so it was very, it was very nerve wracking. And actually, I was, I was very lucky um, that I grew up in a very progressive family that really valued education. So education in our house, in our family was, was sacred. And the power of knowledge and the importance of seeking knowledge was always instilled in us as, as young children. So I had a lot of support from my immediate family um, when it came time to deciding whether I wanted to study abroad. And I, and I decided that I, that I did. I had plenty of role models in my family. In fact, both my parents studied um, out of the UAE and they're, they're graduates of Cairo University back in, back in the 70s. Um, so the harder part for me wasn't necessarily the, the, the going off to, 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 live on, um, to live on my own, because I, I had that sort of the, the support system to allow me to do that. Um, it, was, it was getting the, the grades that, <laughs> that meant that I could go to the, to the university that I, that, I, that I wanted to do. So, so alhamdulillah, like I've, been, I've been very lucky from, from that perspective. I know a lot of women who face um, resistance from, from family members, which makes everything so much harder. Um, you know, if I had plenty of wobbles along the way while I was uh, while I was there, and if I didn't have you know the encouraging voice on the other end of the phone that was saying you know take it easy, you can do this, it's going to be fun, I would have been on the next flight back, back home because it's not it's not an easy it's not an easy thing to feel like you're all on your own all of a sudden and, and all of a sudden you need to you know do your own groceries, do your own laundry, get yourself to back and, and, and forth places. So it can be really overwhelming. And if I didn't have that support, um, it would have been so much harder. So hats off to, to all the women who, who brave all of this resistance to, um, to, to live their ambition of, of, of studying abroad. No, that's uh, that's absolutely right. And look, I mean, the point is, we are so used to living in such integrated societies and such integrated families that whether we realize it or not, we end up doing so many things together. And just having that support system around is so different and frankly, so comforting and so encouraging. And we don't really realize it until we're out of that situation and we're left on our own to fend for ourselves. So absolutely understand it's uh, infinitely more difficult if you don't have a supportive family. That's right. In fact, one of the things that you mentioned is you come from a family of lawyers and doctors. Your mother was a qualified lawyer herself, uh, in addition to being a full-time mom. What role did she play in you becoming a lawyer? Um, so it's a question. <laughs> what is it that they say, Saida? You know, not not all heroes wear capes. Um, <laughs> that's that's so true because because some of them wear abayas, and that was that was my mother. She was she was pretty instrumental in my becoming a lawyer. Um, she was a she was a trailblazer in her in her own way. She was a working mom in, in the 80s. So so at the time, I I felt like I was the only child of, of a working mother and it's, it's only through hindsight you know when you when you meet more people um who lived a similar background to you uh, and you're outside of your circle of you know those those, those children that you went to school with that you that you realize actually no there's there's many more who lived the same experience that i did and it's only really now that i am living in her shoes as a working mother that I look back and I realize just how significant everything that she did um, 
and everything that we took for granted, just how significant that was. I mean, the ADAP, I mean, I'm not, and I'm not joking, I'm the mom that, you know, forgets that it's wear pink t-shirt to school day, or that sends her, that sends her kid with crazy hair on, on crazy hair day, only to find out that it's like the next week. So that, that's me. And, 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 and actually, my mom never, never let those things, never let those things slip. She was just, she was just organized and, and super dedicated. And, and she was uncompromising in, in her love for us, but also in her expectations from us to always perform our best. And you know how they, you know how they say you have to be careful about how you speak to children because that becomes how they speak to themselves. That's and, right. and I think all of this translated to me demanding that of myself. So, so this drive to to perform my best was instilled in me by, by my mother. It's been that drive that has seen me get you know this far in in the in the kind of firm that that, that I'm with. So so yeah, I'd say she was she was pretty instrumental in it all. <laughs> oh, very nice. And for what it's worth, you're not the only mom who forgets. <laughs> There's plenty of us out there. <laughs> But you raise a very, very good point. You're a mother, you're a wife, you're a daughter. I mean, you're so many things in addition to being a professional. How do you balance it all? Oh, look, Saeed, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I'll, I'll tell you how it is. It's not easy, and I, and I don't have the answers, um, especially in a, in a professional services firm. But, but whenever I get asked that question, I always remember this, this story. Um, and I, I had just come back from maternity leave um, with, my, with my third child. And I was put on a really, really significant transaction. It was the first of its kind. And we were working day and night. And my, my son was, was seven months old at the time. And I had to go to London for a 24-hour trip and, and come back. It was all very intense. And we got to the day of signing, or rather the night of signing. And... I had everything organized and everything prepared. I was sitting at my computer in at home, so I was working from home. And there were about 20 other people spread across the world, all waiting for this deal to close. And we were waiting for one last document to, to get agreed. And once it was agreed, we could, we could release it. And the deal would be done. Um, and we sat there at seven, it got to eight, it got to nine, it got to 10. We were still waiting by the time it was 11. And then at midnight, at midnight, the baby started to cry. And my heart literally sank. And I thought, this is it. This is the day that it's all going to be finally too much, that I won't be able to cope, that I will have let someone down, either the baby or my client. Anyway, I ran into his room and I, and I grabbed him and I, and I brought him over into my office. And of course, I mean, of course, it wouldn't happen any other way, but that is when they agreed the final document. And so that's, that's when signing had to happen. Um, and, and I remember the moment so clearly because you know the mom pose where you're like this and you're trying to do everything else with your, with your right hand? That, that was me at like 1 a.m. I was trying to feed him on one side. I was, I was trying to close this deal on the other. And I remember thinking to myself, gosh, there is, there's no glamour in being a working mom. Yeah. But, but the next day, the deal was launched. And it was on the front page of the papers. And my daughter went to school telling her, telling her teacher that my mother was on the front page of the paper. And, and it's in, in that moment that you look back and yeah. you allow yourself a moment to feel proud for what you've done. And it's usually with the benefit of hindsight, like it doesn't feel great at the time, but you look back at that moment and you think, I signed a billion dollar transaction with one hand while you know feeding my baby with the other that is pretty awesome and the 
the point I'm trying to make is is not is not to glorify overworking. The fact is these moments they don't happen every day, but sometimes they do. And your role as a mother sometimes clashes with you know what you need to deliver as a lawyer. And sometimes you need to navigate your way through these competing demands. So, so how do you do that? And my advice is, is take all, all the help you can get. You don't have to be super mom. There's usually a dad in the equation. So, so get, him, get him to contribute. And if, if your family situation doesn't allow, take all the help that you can get from wherever it may come. Extended families, nannies, friends, even the parents groups on WhatsApp you can get support from. They're all sources of support that are that are there for you. And you know how they say it takes a village to raise a child? It's really, it's really true. And nowadays you create your own village. So, so take advantage of that. And and remember we're we're all we're all being the best moms that we know how to be. No one starts off their day thinking, you know what, today I'm gonna be a bad mom. We're all just we're all just doing the best that we can. And at the end of the day, if your child still finds comfort in your arm, then know that you are the best mom for that. Very nicely said. Indeed, it's uh, there is no right answer, right? It's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing battle and you take it one day at a time. One of the other things I've heard you say as uh, quite often is being smart isn't enough. It's important, it's essential, it's starting point, but just being smart isn't enough. What do you mean by that? So maybe this is, this is me showing my, my cynicism, but we've been sold this lie that all you need to do to become success, successful is work hard or be smart. And if you're smarter than the next guy, then, you know, justice will prevail and, and you will get ahead. But that only works if the underlying assumption is true. And that is that people know that you're smarter than that guy. So it's, it's visibility above all else that's more important, I, I feel. It's no good being locked away in a corner, being the hardest, smartest um, worker in your organization if no one knows about you. The, 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 the playing field is only level if everyone is equally visible. And unfortunately, we're not. So, and, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be because of what you're doing. It can be what the people who are looking at you, your spectators, your, your bosses, your managers, it can be their inherent biases that mean that they don't see you in the same way that they see, um, that they see someone else. Um, and, or it can be what, what we're doing, especially as women, especially as Arab women. A lot of our society teaches us that modesty in women is virtuous. So don't speak too loud. Won't be too aggressive. Don't take credit. These things are not modest, and so they're unbecoming of you. Well, I mean, I, I say you don't you don't have to speak louder. You don't have to be more aggressive. You don't have to do anything that is other than being your own genuine self. Just make sure that you're visible. That's absolutely true. Because if somebody doesn't know the work you're doing, they can't really judge it. They can't really give you credit for it. So, oh, very well said. Reem, what advice would you have uh, for some of the younger women and men that are just starting out in their careers? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, but if I, if I had to summarize you know the the best pieces of advice that have that have seen me through. I think it would be something like, you know, th three key pieces of advice. The first one is 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 just to be kind. You know, to be kind to yourself, to be kind to others. In in the end, that's all that that, that really matters. Be be kind in the way that you speak to yourself um, and the way that you treat others around you, you might think that, you know, people get far by, um, by being unkind and, you know, that that is the, the, the recipe for success. 
But remember that, that no one remembers those kinds of people as great leaders. So, so think about the lasting impression that you, that you want to leave behind um, and, and work towards that. Um, the, the second thing I suppose would be about your, your mindset and trying to maintain a, a growth mindset. Be, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Take advantage of these opportunities that will always come your way to step out of your comfort zone. Don't, don't, don't shy away from them because it's invariably those chances that make you the most uncomfortable that will offer you the most opportunity for growing. And as you move through your career, that's what you need. You need career growth. You don't need to stay comfortable and you know, perfect what you do. You need to start um, growing your, your, your credential. And it's only through reaching out and doing things that you're not comfortable with, you get there. Actually, people who are new, um, people who are new in their careers are very good at this. It's something that you lose as you become more senior. So, so, so be aware of it and be alive to it and keep that, keep connected to that curiosity because that's the real reason that will see you grow through your career. Um, and then maybe lastly, I guess this is probably the most important, so maybe I should have mentioned it first, but, but celebrate every experience. And, and I say experience intentionally, I don't say achievement, because you gain far more from your, your failures or, you know, your losses or, or, or constructive experiences, whatever you want to call them. You gain far more from those than, than your achievements. So embrace that, learn from it and, and, and move on. Um, that's what true success looks and feels like. Success is not a series of achievements. It's, it's a bit tougher on the, it's a bit tougher on the spirit than that. It's actually, it's actually a series of failures, the, the sum of which gets you to the place that you ultimately want to be. So, so the sooner that you appreciate that, the, the easier the road will be for you. Very nice, very nice. So be a good person, learn and celebrate all your experiences. Very nicely said. Thank you, Rune. It's been a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you so much, Sadia.